Hello everyone. This video is going to cover autonomic control of the cardiovascular system, specifically reflex circuits affecting the heart and circulation and their relevance to critical care medicine. The heart is a brilliant machine. Its job is to pump and it does so tirelessly for our entire lives. While the topic of this talk is complex and interesting, if the heart itself was to lose any form of neural input, it would still function well enough to keep someone alive. The heart creates its own rhythm of about 100 beats per minute in an adult, and it can tune its output to the amount of blood it receives. The right ventricle generates flow through the lungs, and the left generates pressure for the systemic vessels, and the two can often be thought of as a single mechanism that receives blood from the right atrium and supplies blood to the aorta. In a steady state, the output from the left ventricle is equal to the right, as well as the flow of blood that returns to the right atrium. The steady state can be identified with the unifying variable of right atrial pressure. Under most circumstances, the most important determinant of cardiac output has nothing to do with the nervous system. It is the demand of the body's tissues for perfusion and nutrients. Tissues also regulate local blood flow based on their metabolic requirements. So if demand increases, for example, in exercising skeletal muscle, local blood vessels dilate, lowering systemic vascular resistance and increasing venous return. As you can see, this increases the slope of the venous return curve, creating a new steady state with an increased cardiac output. The cardiac output increases mostly by increasing stroke volume through the Frank Starling mechanism, though there is also a small intrinsic mechanism to increase heart rate with venous return. The complex autonomic system for cardiovascular regulation developed through evolution's drive to optimize cardiovascular performance, both in physiological settings such as exercise or change in posture, and pathological situations such as hemorrhage. The nervous system is the fastest extrinsic form of cardiovascular regulation, able to feedback and fine tune performance within seconds, even anticipating requirements in some cases. As we can see on the graph, sympathetic stimulation of the heart markedly increases potential cardiac output, primarily by increasing heart rate and contractility, although at this point, the steady state is not much greater than without it. The sympathetic nervous system does not just affect the heart, it affects the entire vascular system, including arteries and veins. Sympathetic stimulation increases systemic vascular resistance, primarily on the arterial side, increasing systemic arterial blood pressure, but it also causes veins to contract, decreasing their capacitance and increasing the so-called stressed blood volume. This shifts the resting venous return um, curve up and to the right, as you would also see if you increase total blood volume. Now, if we increase tissue demands, the steady state cardiac output increases dramatically. The stress blood volume doesn't just involve direct venoconstriction. Medullary circuits stimulating the sympathetic nervous system also trigger contraction of skeletal muscles of the abdominal wall. This squeezes blood out of reservoirs such as the liver, spleen, and abdominal veins further augmenting venous return. Certain animals, such as racehorses, can contract the spleen itself in response to sy sympathetic stimulation. Finally, exercising skeletal muscle, particularly in the lower limbs, also pumps venous blood back to the heart. You can now see the effects of sympathetic withdrawal, uh, depicted in gray, with a lowering of cardiac output below baseline. This happens to some extent in physiological situations such as sleep, but it can also be seen when sympathetic outflow is silenced by spinal cord injury or spinal anesthesia, in which case it's known as neurogenic shock. The parasympathetic nervous system shown in green has a relatively minor overall effect on blood vessels, but does provide negative feedback on cardiac output, primarily by reducing heart rate through vagal stimulation of the sinoatrial node. This can decrease the magnitude of the cardiac output curve well below that for sympathetic withdrawal, all the way to zero in some cases. So let's look at the anatomy of some of these pathways. Again, in this purple color are some of the sympathetic nerves that supply the heart, coming from the sympathetic chain with fibers originating in the thoracic spine, along with parasympathetic nerves shown in green. The parasympathetic supply to the heart comes entirely from the vagus nerves, the 10th cranial nerve. You can see the left vagus nerve passing down here. The sympathetic and parasympathetic nerve fibers supplying the heart weave together into an intricate 
nerve plexus that has been described as the intrinsic cardiac nervous system, or more poetically, as the little brain of the heart. It includes an estimated 14 to 40,000 neurons and around 1,000 ganglia. Autonomic preganglionic nerves usually originate in the central nervous system and then synapse at ganglia with postganglionic nerves which supply the end organ. These ganglia are not simple relays. It is an opportunity to further pro process diverging and converging signals from above. Many sympathetic neurons synapse in paraversible ganglia, though some and many parasympathetic preganglionic neurons synapse at peripheral or preversebral ganglia closer to the organ in question. The cardiac nerve plexus and ganglia also contain afferent nerves, which send sensory information back along the vagus nerve or via sympathetic nerves and the spinal cord. There are also local circuit neurons which function like interneurons and do not interact directly with the heart or CNS, as well as spontaneously acting efferent neurons without preganglionic innovation that instead receive information from afferent fibers and probably local circuit neurons. This creates the possibility of afferent and efferent reflex arcs entirely within the intrinsic cardiac nervous system. Moving down, we pass under the pericardial reflection. All nerves and vessels entering and exiting the heart have to pass through here, like the hilum of the lung. The sinoatrial node receives both sympathetic and parasympathetic input to regulate the heart rate, or chronotropy. Nerves supplying the AV node and conduction system modulate the speed of impulse conduction, known as dromotropy. The myocardium itself is mostly supplied by sympathetic efferent fibers, which increase contractility or inotropy, as well as relaxation and filling or lusotropy. The heart also has numerous different afferent neurons which respond to chemical and mechanical stimuli and are concentrated in particular areas. I'll discuss those in more detail as they are so generally associated with specific reflexes. While this video will focus on the classic reflexes that are mainly processed at the level of the medulla oblongata, it is important to emphasize that there are now considered to be a hierarchy of reflexes at multiple levels, forming layers of fine tuning and redundancy. At the lowest level are so-called intracardiac reflexes for reflexes processed in the cardiac ganglia, some of which do not even leave the pericardial reflection. The second major level are intrathoracic but extracardiac reflexes, for example, involving sympathetic ganglia. The third level involves the central nervous system, starting at the medulla and spinal cord. Let's look further up. Exiting the skull is another cranial nerve, the glossopharyngeal nerve. It's important for the cardiovascular reflexes as it contains afferent signals from sensors in the carotid arteries. For example, the carotid bodies are major peripheral chemoreceptors monitoring the oxygen, CO2, and acid content of arterial blood. The carotid bulbs <coughs> also contain me mechanical stretch receptors, known as baroreceptors, which monitor blood pressure in the artery. The vagus nerve contain carries most visceral afferent fibers from the heart, lungs, and great vessels, for example, from another set of baroreceptors and chemoreceptors at the aortic arch. You can also see the recurrent laryngeal nerve branching from the left vagus nerve. Now let's look at the cervical and thoracic spinal cord. I'm also going to discuss neural control of respiration in this talk, so it's worth pointing out the anatomy of the phrenic nerve. The diaphragm is skeletal muscle, and like other skeletal muscle, its lowermost neurons are in the ventral spinal cord, in this case between C3 and C5. The phrenic nerve comes from these three roots and travels down through the mediastinum. Unlike typical skeletal muscle, most of the control of the diaphragm comes from fibers descending from the ventrolateral medulla. In a similar fashion, another set of bulbospinal neurons supply the bodies of preganglionic sympathetic neurons. These are located in the intromediolateral nucleus that descends through the thoracic to the top of the lumbar spinal cord. Sympathetic fibers travel out to the thoracic chain and up to the superior, middle, 
and inferior cervical ganglia. The latter fuses with the first thoracic ganglion and together are known as the stellate ganglion. And that's the second thoracic ganglion. The heart receives sympathetic input from the stellate ganglion as well as thoracic ganglia down to around T4 or T5. Now we have our third major level of cardiac reflex, the central nervous system. In this case, an afferent signal from the heart travels up the vagus nerve, is processed in the medulla, and triggers an efferent signal via the bulbospinal tract and sympathetic chain. To summarize, the main afferent nerve fibers involved in brainstem cardiovascular reflexes travel via the glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves. Note that even though the signals follow the vagus nerve, they are not considered part of the parasympathetic nervous system. There is nothing that particularly relates these sensory nerves to the efferent fibers that ultimately stimulate muscarinic receptors besides the common anatomy. Likewise, some afferent signals travel from the heart via the sympathetic chain and spinal cord, but are not otherwise related to the sympathetic nervous system. Sensory fibers from pain, touch, and muscle sensors also affect the cardiovascular system, often at the level of the spinal cord. Other important afferents include other cranial nerves, especially the trigeminal nerve, as well as numerous layered interactions with higher sensors. In terms of efferents to the heart, you've probably picked up the main ones are the vagus nerve and the sympathetic chain. These make up the true parasympathetic and sympathetic pathways. I'll also mention some of the other efferent pathways. Most of these are involved in respiration. We have also already touched on one with the abdominal compression reflex, which involves somatic motor neurons um, to the abdominal wall. Let's keep going up. This is the brainstem with the medulla oblongata, pons and midbrain. You can also see the optic tract, some of the hypothalamus and the cerebellum in the background. Most of the fundamental cardiac reflexes are processed at the level of the medulla, which should make sense as that's where the vagus and glossopharyngeal nerves enter. And it's also the main source of descending fibers to the phrenic and sympathetic nerve bodies in the spinal cord. We'll get to how the processing takes place later. Keeping with the theme of multiple hierarchies and the near infinite complexity of the central nervous system, there are also ascending and descending pathways for even more layers of control. The medulla might be the core, but it also has close interactions with other centers in the pons, midbrain, and hypothalamus. There are even more layers above involving the limbic system and higher centers. I want to discuss the anatomy of these medullary nuclei, but unfortunately the anatomy isn't particularly intuitive. Often when I find something confusing, I try to look at it in look at the more simple underlying principles that lead to it. But when that something is anatomy, the only place to go is embryology. This is a zygote. It doesn't get much simpler than one cell. We'll skim through the early stages. It keeps splitting to blastula, morula, blastocyst. Up until this point, the cells were totipotent. You could pull one off and grow another identical person. From here on, the cell masses start to differentiate. The blastocyst forms into an outer cell mass and an inner cell mass with a fluid-filled cavity. The outer cell mass divides to form the preliminary placenta. The inner cell mass forms into the hyperblast and epiblast cell populations. The hyperblast surrounds the initial cavity, which becomes a yolk sac, and the epiblast forms a new amniotic cavity. The hypoblast population disappears and the epiblast population differentiates into endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm. Extra embryonic mesoderm also forms a third cavity around the whole embryo with the chorionic sac. Let's look closer. The mesoderm forms a structure called the nosocord, which helps guide differentiation. Now, is where, now this is where things get important for us. The ectoderm folds in on itself, forming the neural tube and neural crest. The neural tube differentiates into basal plate, and, which is ventral, and alar plate, which is dorsal. And within these plates, further layers form from dorsal to ventral. Now, you may have come across these before regarding cranial nerves. They're essentially different populations of afferent and efferent neurons. From dorsal to ventral, you have somatic afferent, somat special afferent, visceral afferent, 
the dividing sulcus limitans, then visceral efferent, branchial efferent, and somatic efferent. Even though the cell groups morph and shuffle over time, they tend to keep a loose divide between afferent and efferent. This is a simplification because we have a couple more subtypes of afferent and efferent, as well as numerous interneurons that don't fit neatly into one category. If you look at figure B on the far right, this is a similar depiction that's closer to our current understanding. Not only do the cells differ from dorsal to ventral, but also from rostral to caudal, as you can see on figure A. The figure on the left combines both through a segment of brainstem. I haven't included this level in my level of detail in my own diagrams for obvious reasons. This is another source depicting how the cell types migrate, and this is a somewhat simpler depiction of the pattern across the ventral, lateral, and rostral caudal dimensions. Let's stick with our six category version. On the left, I've shown some examples that fit into the different fit the different groups. The nuclei are not homogeneous columns through the entire brainstem, so in order to see them properly, we need a third dimension. This is how those same nuclei look in the medulla in three dimensions, although it's not quite that simple. We also need to consider a few nuclei that don't neatly fit those categories, as they are mostly composed of interneurons. Apart from distinct nuclei and tracts, there is a relatively amorphous group of nuclei throughout the brainstem known as the reticular formation. We are specifically interested in the intermediate reticular formation, which takes the form of two curtains that curl out ventrolaterally. You should be able to see that most of our important structures are contained within the IRF. This includes two new columns. After rotating clockwise, we're now looking primarily at the left intermediate reticular formation from across the midline. Starting from the dorsum, we have a visceral efferent nucleus, the dorsal mosa nucleus of the vagus, which provides some parasympathetic efferent fibers, though plays a relatively minor role. Next, we have an extremely important visceral afferent, the nucleus of the solitary tract. The NTS is the first stop for nearly all visceral afferent information in the medulla and the first processing step of most cardiac reflexes. On the right in orange, we have the facial nerve nucleus, which is branchial efferent, as well as the nucleus ambiguous, which is the most dorsal medial of three important columns in the ventrolateral medulla. The next two can be thought of as a respiratory column and a cardiovascular column. The respiratory column has a series of nuclei, which I will discuss in more detail later. The cardiovascular column is usually just called the ventrolateral medulla, which is divided into rostral, intermediate, and caudal. The rostral ventrolateral medulla is the main source of bulbospinal fibers to the intermediolateral nucleus in the spinal cord that contains preganglionic neurons for the sympathetic chain. Most laterally, we have the vagus and glossopharyngeal nerves themselves. To demonstrate the major relationships between these nuclei, I'm just going to outline the main pathways for the baroreceptor reflex. We start at the glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves, which carry baroreceptor signals from the carotid and aortic baroreceptors, respectively. Because these are visceral afferent signals, I've already said they'll go to the nucleus of the solitary tract for initial processing. The baroreceptor reflex is designed to provide negative feedback to counter changes in blood pressure. The body also uses endocrine and renal mechanisms to regulate blood pressure, but the neural reflexes are the fastest. These high pressure baroreceptors have enough temporal resolution that their signal varies with each arterial pulse. They are triggered by both the magnitude of arterial stretch and the rate of increase. Higher pressure means the neurons fire more frequently. Once they arrive at the nucleus of the solitary tract, the high blood pressure signal needs to stimulate the parasympathetic output to slow down the heart rate and lower cardiac output and inhibit sympathetic output, which also reduces heart rate as well as contractility and vascular resistance. Interneurons from the NTS stimulate the nucleus ambiguous and dorsal motor nucleus of vagus which contain the nerve bodies of the preganglionic parasympathetic neurons, 
which exit the brainstem via the vagus nerve. The NTS also sends interneurons to the caudal ventrolateral medulla, which sends inhibitory fibers to the rostral ventrolateral medulla. As mentioned, the RVLM sends neurons that stimulate preganglionic sympathetic neurons in the spinal cord. The NTS also sends ascending fibers to other brainstem nuclei and the hypothalamus. For example, low high blood pressure relatively inhibits arousal of the cortex and conversely, low blood pressure will activate arousal signals. To start, let's look at the situation when blood pressure is very low and there's minimal input from arterial baroreceptors. The NTS does not send out signals to the nucleus ambiguous and DMNV, and there is relatively low parasympathetic outflow to the heart. The heart usually receives a basal parasympathetic input, so withdrawal of this alone will tend to increase the heart rate closer to its intrinsic rate of around 100 beats per minute in adults. There is also a lack of stimulation to the inhibitory interneurons of the CVLM. The disinhibited RVLM neurons have intrinsic activity and therefore send st stimulatory signals to the sympathetic chain, further increasing the heart rate, as well as contractility, vascular resistance, and augmenting venous return. These effects in combination will work to increase blood pressure until it starts activating the baroreceptors. Once the patient is normotensive, baroreceptors provide pulsatile input corresponding with the arterial blood pressure. This intermittently stimulates basal parasympathetic outflow and inhibits some sympathetic outflow, leading to a balance of signals. When the baroreceptors sense a high blood pressure, there is increased vagal stimulation to reduce the heart rate and stronger inhibition of the sympathetic outflow, which again reduce, uh, return the blood pressure back to its baseline level. This is one of the simpler reflex circuits, though it's probably the most important for a conceptual understanding. We'll see at least one other reflex that has a very similar um, circuitry pattern. Others need to invert the signals. For example, the peripheral chemoreflex, which can activ activate parts of the RVLM directly, and the cardiac sympathetic afferent reflex, which inhibits the baroreflex in the NTS. The sympathetic and parasympathetic outputs are always going to be the same, and the initial sensory processing is usually at the NTS. I'm now going to zoom out slightly. To stay oriented, we're still looking at the medulla and now pontine regions from the right side across the midline. I'm now going to talk about the respiratory column. Remember, for the most part, the heart just runs itself. The lungs, on the other hand, are completely passive, controlled by fluctuations in pleural pressure by the diaphragm and accessory skeletal muscles. I've included the labels of the nuclei themselves, as well as clusters of subnuclei that are described by the phase of inspiration during which they are active. I've used bright green for stimulatory neurons and red for inhibitory. Breathing can be described by three phases, inspiration, post-inspiration, and expiration. Expiration can be active or passive, and the post-inspiratory phase is not always present. The single most important site in the brainstem for control of ventilation is the pre-Botzinger nucleus or complex. The reason for its obscure name is actually pretty funny. I need to start with how the more rostral Botzinger nucleus was named. It was discovered by Professor Jack Feldman and mentioned in a meeting in Stockholm in 1977. The next year he was at a conference in Hirschhorn, Germany, when a colleague presented data elaborating on his findings. At this point, Feldman was concerned that the region had not yet been named and arbitrarily chose the name of a white wine that happened to be at their table. Around 1990, he and some colleagues discovered that a more caudal region to the Botzinger nucleus was actually generating respiratory rhythm and called it the pre-Botzinger complex because they thought that the more anatomically correct post-Botzinger complex would diminish its importance. <laughs> 
This ridiculously named nucleus is the closest thing the respiratory system has to a sinoatrial node. It is capable of generating a regular inspiratory signal that activates ramp I ne neurons in the rostral VRG, which activate the motor neurons and the phrenic nerve and trigger contraction of the diaphragm. As expiration is usually passive, this inspiratory signal is all you need for a simple respiratory rhythm. That said, the neural control of breathing is more complicated than a heartbeat. Breathing is partly under conscious control. We use breathing to speak, and we can hold our breath voluntarily. We use the post-inspiratory period to increase abdominal pressure for urination and defecation. We need to protect our airway when swallowing and coordinate breathing when we cough or sneeze. When exercising or unwell, we may need to increase respiratory effort with the use of accessory muscles during inspiration and expiration. This is the reason for the different phases of respiration and for the phases to proceed in order requires an interacting network of different centers. The most distinctive feature of this network is mutual inhibition. When nodes are mutually inhibiting each other, the system is relatively stable when only one is active and less stable when both are active. The system needs a certain amount of stability and instability to exist in one state at a time and then move to the next. Early in the respiratory phase, the pre-botzinger nucleus and related inspiratory nodes are active and the post-inspiratory and expiratory centers are inhibited. As the cycle progresses, the balance slowly shifts and the inhibition of the post-inspiratory complex or PICO eases off. Activity now moves to the PICO, which is a small region rostral to the Botzinger complex. Post-inspiratory neurons inhibit most other centers. This phase is essential for actions such as swallowing. The third and final phase is based in the lateral parafacial respiratory group in front of the facial nerve nucleus and near to the retrotrapezoid nucleus. When respiratory drive is high, expiratory neurons stimulate ramp E neurons in the caudal VRG, which activate muscles to augment expiration, for example, in the abdominal wall. During the expiratory phase, the post-inspiratory complex is partially inhibited, but still active. Late in the respiratory phase, PICO activity trails off and the intrinsic activity of pre botzinger and new neurons initiate a new inspiratory phase. There is a secondary respiratory area in the pons which provides tonic stimulation and inhibition for different nodes. The respiratory rhythm generator also receives input from the nucleus of the solitary tract to provide feedback from pulmonary stretch receptors, for example, and the respiratory and cardiovascular centers interact extensively. The most important source of tonic drive to the respiratory network is the retrotrapezoid nucleus, which functions as a central chemoreceptor and is responsible for our baseline respiratory drive. The effect of tonic stimulation on parts of this network is not necessarily intuitive, though it has been explored through simplified computer models such as this one. This varies the strength of stimulation to each component of a four node network and shows the effect on the length of inspiratory, expiratory phases and the total respiratory period. You could imagine that each node and each tonic stimulus are one neuron. I tried modeling the effect of varying different strengths of tonic stimulation based on the effects we saw on the previous graphs. I found the animation didn't add a great deal, but it did help to illustrate the oscillations between different states created by mutual inhibition. The one point to take away is that tonically stimulating all neurons at once will decrease both the inspiratory and expiratory period, increasing the respiratory rate. This effect is what we see when chemoreceptors in the retrotrapezoid nucleus are stimulated by CO2 and acidosis. Now let's take a step back. To put things as simply as possible, the central respiratory generator consists of three centers, one for each phase, inspiration, post-inspiration, 
and expiration. These rely on tonic stimulation from central chemoreceptors, primarily in the retrotrapezoid nucleus. In a sleeping subject, lowering the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood, even slightly below baseline, will effectively in eliminate the drive to breathe. In practice, continuous metabolic production ensures that this stimulus is always present. Finally, I'm going to talk about specific cardiac reflexes, starting with the one that we've already touched on, the arterial baroreceptor reflex. Heterogeneous stretch receptors detect both systemic blood pressure and changes in blood pressure, mostly in the aorta and carotid arteries. Myelinated low threshold A fibers and non-myelinated high threshold C fibers transmit the signals via the glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves to the nucleus of the solitary tract in the medulla. High blood pressure signals lead to stimulation of preganglionic parasympathetic neurons in the nucleus ambiguous and DMNV to increase vagal stimulation of the heart, primarily slowing the heart rate. The NTS also stimulates the CVLM, which inhibits tonically active neurons in the RVLM and decreases activation of preganglionic sympathetic neurons in the intramedial lateral nucleus of the spinal cord. This further reduces heart rate, as well as contractility and systemic arterial and venous tone. When arterial signals decrease due to low blood pressure, the opposite efferent effects respond to increased blood pressure. The baroreflex response also provides weak inhibition to the respiratory center, potentially manifesting as brief apnea with rapid increases in blood pressure or as an increase in respiration in hypotensive states, although this can also be due to peripheral chemoreceptor responses, for example. The overall function of the arterial baroreceptor reflex is to provide rapid negative feedback of feedback regulation of arterial blood pressure, for example, with changes in posture, as well as helping to augment blood pressure and cardiac output in pathological hypotensive states. The most direct Pathological illustration of the baroreceptor reflex is syncope resulting from external stimulation of baroreceptors in the carotid sinus. Baroreceptor function is also relevant to disorders characterized by orthostatic intolerance, such as POTS and chronic arterial hypertension. The next reflex is a bit more obscure. It's known as the bezold jarrett reflex. If you read about it, you might see some conflation with other effects. So in this context, I'm using it to describe a response to stimulation of specific receptors in the myocardium. These are stretch receptors that are also chemosensitive. Experimentally, they are activated by capsaicin and alkaloids from verasum species, a poisonous flowering plant. Endogenously, they appear to be activated by some prostaglandins and solutes associated with ischemia and reperfusion, such as potassium. Mechanically, they are activated by left ventricular stretch, as well as distortion that could be associated with an underfilled hyperdynamic ventricle. Signals are carried by unmyelinated C fibers via the vagus nerve to the nucleus of the solitary tract. The resulting circuitry closely resembles the baroreceptor reflex with similar effects, bradycardia, vasodilation, and hypoventilation or even complete apnea. The vagal effects seem to be more prominent than the sympathoinhibitory effects, and it's thought that the function of this reflex is likely cardioprotective in the face of excessive afterload or ischemia. It likely contributes to disproportionate bradycardia and hypotension in some myocardial infarctions, and may be the cause for syncopal episodes in advanced aortic stenosis. When infants are treated with intravenous prostaglandin E1, for congenital heart disease, they develop bradycardia, hypotension, and apnea, likely due to stimulation of these receptors. Now we're getting even more obscure. There is more than one type of sensory nerve in the myocardial wall. Not all of them follow the vagus nerve. Some follow the sympathetic nerves back to the spinal cord. These nerves are less active than vagal afferents and also carry pain due, during myocardial ischemia.
Despite entering the medulla from the spinal nerves instead of a cranial nerve, they still project to the nucleus of the solitary tract. They are effectively chemoreceptors and respond primarily to myocardial ischemia by detecting acidosis and inflammatory mediators such as serotonin. They cause an inverse of what we see with the baroreceptor response, actually inhibiting those NTS neurons and enhancing the peripheral chemoreceptor response. This causes an overall increase in sympathetic stimulation, cardiac output and blood pressure. It's potentially counterproductive as it can generate arrhythmias and increase myocardial oxygen demand. Now we've discussed the respiratory column, we can return to the peripheral chemoreceptor response. Unlike central chemoreceptors, which respond to CO2 and acidosis, peripheral chemoreceptor bodies also detect hypoxia. The peripheral chemoreceptors function as the major physiological sensors of hypoxia and also mount a second line response to hypotension and clinical shock. Like the baroreceptors, the chemoreceptor afferents follow the glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves. The cardiovascular effects of the chemoreceptor reflex are interesting. It causes direct activation of the RVLM as well as vagus efferents, leading to both hypertension and bradycardia. Like the baroreceptor response to hypotension, it causes cortical arousal, likely to a greater extent. Think of a patient with sleep apnea. They become hypoxic, then wake up and breathe. Finally, it causes stimulation of the central respiratory generator in an attempt to correct the respiratory failure. The part of this I found confusing was the effect on heart rate. Initially, I found conflicting sources, some of which claimed that the heart rate would increase with chemoreceptor stimulation. It can, but not directly. The key question is whether the patient is breathing spontaneously. Like I mentioned, the direct effect of chemoreceptor stimulation is bradycardia. Bradycardia reduces myocardial oxygen demands if hypoxia is not imminently going to resolve. If a fetus becomes hypoxic, the response is bradycardia. If a patient becomes apneic and hypoxic, a common response is bradycardia. Chemoreceptors also stimulate breathing and breathing stimulates the heart rate. You can study the effect of chemoreceptor stimulation in animals by giving small quantities of cyanide that preferentially stimulate the chemoreceptors. If they are ventilated at a constant rate or breath holding underwater, they will become bradycardic, but when they're breathing spontaneously, they become tachycardic. If a patient is hypoxic and breathing spontaneously, they will become tachypneic and then tachycardic. The reason breathing more increases heart rate is due to cardiorespiratory coupling. The medullary cardiovascular and respiratory columns are intricately linked and influence each other in both directions. I've already mentioned how respiratory drive is stimulated by peripheral chemoreceptors and inhibited by the bezel jarish reflex and arterial baroreceptors to a lesser extent. Conversely, the cardiac baroreceptor response is in influenced by the respiratory cycle. During inspiration, respiratory neurons send inhibitory signals to preganglionic vagal neurons, causing them to become hyperpolarized and less sensitive to stimulation from baroreceptors via the NTS. Sympathetic outflow from the RVLM also fluctuates during the respiratory cycle. Together, these lead to an inspiratory tachycardia known as respiratory sinus arrhythmia. RSA helps to compensate for a transient decrease in LV stroke volume due to expansion of the pulmonary vessels during inspiration. Another potential function may be to augment cardiac output during a favorable period for oxygenation. Like for the cardiovascular system, there are a number of respiratory reflexes that are beyond the scope of this video. Afferent fibers from lung stretch receptors follow the vagus nerve to the nucleus of the solitary tract. They mostly influence the respiratory circuits, usually involving uh, negative feedback. Lung stretch also inhibits parasympathetic outflow and can stimulate sympathetic outflow to systemic blood vessels, particularly with sudden deep inspiration. This provides a further mechanism for the respiratory effort to increase heart rate. Most cardiovascular afferents have come from the systemic arteries or ventricles so far,
but now I'm going to look at low pressure receptors. There are stretch receptors in both atria, but I'm going to focus on the right. Right atrial stretch detectors, particularly with the more proximal type B receptors, sense central venous pressure, which is primarily determined by effective blood volume. The signals are carried through myelinated fibers up to the vagus, up the vagus nerve to the nucleus of the solitary tract. The Bainbridge reflex describes a neurally mediated tachycardia seen with rapid administration of an IV fluid bolus. Direct stretch on the sinoatrial node can increase the heart rate directly by up to 15%, while the Bainbridge reflex can contribute a further 40 to 60%. What does this achieve? CVP also changes with fluctuations in venous return, which needs to match cardiac output at the steady state. Heart rate directly influences cardiac output, so in a way it's a form of negative feedback because it's increasing the rate at which volume is being removed from the atrium, at least in the very short term, and the Bainbridge reflex does seem to be short-lived. The neural pathway leading to the increased heart rate is less direct than those discussed previously. This is because it's only part of a larger response to volume status. The NTS stimulates noradrenergic A1 neurons in the caudal ventrolateral medulla, which project to multiple hypothalamic nuclei, including the paraventricular nucleus. The PVN projects fibers back to the rostral ventrolateral medulla, specifically stimulating presympathetic neurons, ultimately stimulating the sinoatrial node. The Bainbridge reflex does not have a significant effect on contractility or stroke volume. Atrial stretch selectively inhibits sympathetic outflow to renal arteries, which increases renal blood flow and inhibits renin secretion. Other hypothalamic projections integrate with osmolarity sensors to inhibit thirst and antidiuretic hormone release. There's a further non-neurally mediated response to atrial stretch. The muscle releases atrial natriuretic peptide into the circulation which acts as a diuretic at multiple sites throughout the nephron, as well as a modest vasodilator. When the patient is in a state of volume depletion, a decrease in atrial stretch means that all of these renal and endocrine mechanisms are reversed, which together work to conserve and replace intravascular fluid. What happens to the tachycardia um, response in volume depletion? Is there a reverse Bainbridge reflex? I'm personally skeptical that it exists, but it's difficult to say. Most experiments establishing the Bainbridge reflex have done so by stretching the atrium either with a balloon or volume administration. Volume depletion tends to cause tachycardia primarily through the bar baroreceptor reflex. Is the baroreflex just stronger? It probably is, but that's not the main issue. The tachycardia with the Bainbridge appears to be entirely sympathetically mediated rather than reciprocal antagonism as we see with the baroreflex for example. Sympathetic withdrawal does not cause bradycardia on its own, just less tachycardia. So why do certain patients with decreased effective blood volume develop bradycardia? Because they do, for example in spinal anesthesia, orthostatic syncope and decompensated hemorrhagic shock. I've done a lot of reading on this topic, and I've regularly seen it blamed on three different eponymous reflexes. A reverse Bainbridge reflex, a paradoxical form of the bezel jarish reflex, or from an underfilled left ventricle, or what I suspect is the main culprit, the barcroft edholm reflex. Among other things, this is the process underlying so-called vasovagal syncope. It's effectively another atrial stretch reflex, though it has multiple potential contributing factors. It's not a reverse Bainbridge reflex because the neural pathways are entirely different. Often there's a biphasic process with an initial sympathetic phase with pallor and diaphoresis, followed by a sympathetic withdrawal and a variable degree of parasympathetic stimulation. This can lead to a predominantly bradycardic, vasodilatory or combined picture with a rapid fall in blood pressure and cerebral perfusion often causing loss of consciousness. It's a pretty counterintuitive process. Why do we sometimes faint when we're moderately hypovolemic? 
We've already covered a couple of negative feedback mechanisms that should maintain cerebral perfusion, and there's one more that's coming next. These don't just fail, the body overrides them, triggering bradycardia and even vasodilation in an apparent attempt to kill the patient. Why? There are two broad evolutionary theories, both relating to forms of trauma. The first relates to one of the most potent stimuli of this reflex, advanced hemorrhagic shock. A major cause for mortality in vertebrates is trauma, specifically hemorrhage. Before concepts of first aid or trauma care, an animal would have to rely on its body's intrinsic hemostatic mechanisms to survive. While tissue injury can cause some local vasoconstriction to aid with hemostasis, for major arterial hemorrhage, this is often inadequate. A high systemic blood pressure expels the blood that you have remaining faster, and the high flow impairs hemostasis. The Barcroft et Holm driven decompensation seen in hemorrhagic shock might be an evolutionary form of the permissive hypotension that is a core principle of modern trauma care. The other theory is effectively that the organism is playing dead. Various mammals have some form of freeze response to fear, notably opossums and juvenile deer. A specific subtype known as alarm bradycardia appears to be the closest analog. In the setting of an inescapable threat, suddenly becoming motionless may decrease attention from a predator. A variant of this theory suggests that it originated or was amplified specifically during conflict between humans where it may have protected non-combatants. In any case, it appears to be an evolutionary adaptation in the setting of physical trauma and elements of both theories may be correct. Actual syncope is uncommon in other animals and may be related to our upright posture, particularly with the brain above the level of the heart and relatively high cerebral oxygen consumption. There are multiple possible triggers for this response and individuals differ in their susceptibility. The major hemodynamic and biochemical triggers are decreased effective circulating blood volume particularly in combination with markers of tissue hypoperfusion, as seen with hemorrhagic shock. Like other cardiac afferents, the afferent hemodynamic signals are initially processed at the NTS. Another major ascending stimulus are certain forms of visceral pain. Pain from an abdominal viscera in these cases is often transmitted via the vagus nerve, but can be also um, via spinal pathways. Cope's sign is bradycardia due to calculus cholecystitis, which has been noted to improve with adequate pain control. Another notable stimulus is surgical pneumoperitoneum or hemoperitoneum via multiple pathways. It is notoriously difficult to estimate blood loss in ruptured ectopic pregnancy based on vital signs due to the frequent relative bradycardia. Pel painful stimulation of pelvic organs can have a similar effect. For example, uterine inversion and instrumentation of product or products of conception in the cervical os. Descending stimuli can also include strong emotions, often fear, particularly related to injury, for example, blood or needle phobia. Descending signals from the cortex, hypothalamus and limbic system, and descending signals from the medulla converge in the ventrolateral periaqueductal gray matter of the midbrain. The periaqueductal gray matter is responsible for a range of physical and behavioral responses to stress and injury. Once the stimuli reach a certain threshold, the ventrolateral PAG sends descending signals to a so far unmentioned region, the caudal midline medulla. This stimulates both vagal preganglionic efferents and inhibits sympathetic outflow at multiple levels. The final two reflexes I'm going to outline involve stimuli from the head. The CNS ischemic response is the final negative feedback mechanism attempting to maintain cerebral perfusion. Cerebral perfusion pressure is the difference between systemic arterial pressure and the intracranial pressure. So CPP can be low in cases of refractory systemic hypotension or raised intracranial pressure. The hypertensive response to raised intracranial pressure is also known as the Cushing reflex.
it is sympathetically mediated and the afferent limb is thought to involve direct stimulation of the RVLM itself. There is evidence that this region can respond to both chemical indicators of ischemia, such as low oxygen or high lactate, as well as mechanical distortion. Sympathetic outflow is also regulated upstream by the hypothalamus and direct stimulation of certain hypothalamic regions will lead to particular cardiovascular changes. Some sources suggest that parts of the hypothalamus are also capable of sensing the ischemia associated with raised intracranial pressure and subsequently stimulate the RVLM. If this is the case, it likely represents an additional layer of control rather than the primary mechanism. A rat study of descending brain death suggested that blood pressure might dip temporarily as the hypothalamic inputs are lost, but there would still be a, a typical Cushing response when the stimulation reached the RVLM. There is effectively a linear increase in sympathetic outflow and mean arterial pressure with even small increases in intracranial pressure, such that the cerebral perfusion pressure is maintained. The CNS ischemic response is by far the most powerful cardiac reflex in terms of increased systemic vascular resistance, with the potential to increase mean arterial pressure up to 250 millimeters of mercury for up to two, 10 minutes, occluding peripheral vessels and ceasing urine output. The arterial barrier reflex will attempt to counter such high pressures but cannot compete with direct stimulation of the RVLM, so the main result is parasympathetically mediated bradycardia, which is another feature of the classic Cushing response. The CNS ischemic response seems to be a protective, if desperate, physiological reflex. Certain intracranial conditions, notably subarachnoid hemorrhage, can manifest with so-called paroxysmal sympathetic hyperactivity, which is a less directly related to cerebral perfusion pressure and may involve pathological activation of the same mechanisms. PSH can manifest with supraphysiological sympathetic stimulation of the heart itself, causing deep T-wave inversions on the ECG, ventricular arrhythmias, neurogenic stunned myocardium or pulmonary edema. Neurogenic stunned myocardium is likely on a spectrum with Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, though the latter tends to be associated with emotional or systemic physiological stresses. There has also been speculation that some of the mechanisms underlying the CNS ischemic response might contribute to chronic hypertension. Our final cardiac reflex in this overview is an atypical one, but very important in certain circumstances. Simply put, it manifests as bradycardia ranging to asystole with stimulation of afferent fibers in any branches of the trigeminal nerve. It is the quintessential example of an oxygen conserving reflex and has deep evolutionary origins. All air breathing vertebrates will exhibit some degree of bradycardia while diving underwater, and this is more pronounced in mammals, with some taking it to the extreme. For someone mostly familiar with human physiology, the ability of animals such as seals to tolerate prolonged breath holding is almost unbelievable. Seals reduce, routinely hold their breath for 20 minutes at a time while diving. Some elephant seals have been known to reach depths of over two kilometers or 7,000 feet with an apnea time of up to two hours. This requires a range of physiological adaptations that are beyond the scope of this video, but a major component is a pronounced diving reflex. While diving, a seal's heart rate is usually between half and a third of that at the surface, around 30 beats per minute, and during deep dives or when combined with a startle response can reach as low as four beats per minute. In humans, the bradycardia is more modest, causing an average reduction in heart rate of about 40%. The specific stimulus of cold water to the face combined with the voluntary act of breath holding is required for a full diving response, which can be also be enhanced by behavioral cues. Stimulation of the face with cold water can be used to trigger the trigeminocardiac reflex therapeutically in the management of supraventricular tachycardia. As I mentioned with the peripheral chemoreceptor reflex, the physiological response to hypoxia itself varies greatly based on whether the individual is breathing spontaneously at the time. 
The chemoreceptor response and apnea ultimately combine with the trigeminocardiac cardiac reflex to reinforce the initial hemodynamic changes. The neural pathways of the trigeminocardiac cardiac reflex are a little different, naturally starting with the afferent trigeminal nerve. This has its own nucleus, nuclei which project directly to parasympathetic preganglionic efferents rather than via the nucleus of the solitary tract. The reflex also causes suppression of respiratory drive, peripheral vasoconstriction and cerebral vasodilation. These combine to ensure that the most essential tissues receive the vast majority of available oxygen and the overall metabolic requirements of the body are reduced. Trigeminal stimulation is also associated with vaguely mediated gastric hypermobility, which hints at another possible evolutionary role for oxygen conservation in infants while feeding. A subtype of this reflex is known as the oculocardiac reflex and is seen with compression of the ocular globe or manipulation of extraocular muscles, for example during surgery. Direct stimulation of trigeminal afferent nerves during craniofacial surgery has also been associated with life-threatening bradyarrhythmias. Like most reflex bradyarrhythmias, these can be prevented by administration of an antimuscarinic such as atropine or glycopyrrolate. It is suspected that the trigeminocardiac reflex plays a significant role in the pathogenesis of sudden infant death syndrome. Another cranial nerve cardiac reflex involves the vestibular system and regulation of hemodynamics with changes in posture in combination with baroreceptor reflexes. There are also somatosympathetic reflexes at both spinal and medullary levels and integrated neural responses to exercise and sleep, which are less directly clinically relevant. I'm now going to leave the brainstem following the afferent pathways to take a quick look at some effector mechanisms. We've already seen the preganglionic parasympathetic nerve bodies in the nucleus ambiguous and DMNV, so let's look at the sympathetic ones. Descending presympathetic nerve fibers, mostly from the RVLM, follow a bulbospinal tract to the intermediolateral column of the thoracic spinal cord. These stimulate cholinergic preganglionic sympathetic nerve bodies in the IML, which stimulate nicotinic receptors on postganglionic sympathetic efferent nerves in para and prevertebral sympathetic ganglia. Meanwhile, the parasympathetic descending fibers follow the vagus nerve separately. Both types of ganglionic synapses involve acetylcholine with nicotinic receptors, postganglionic sympathetic efferent neurons release noradrenaline, while postganglionic parasympathetic efferents release acetylcholine. Remember, acetylcholine is broken down by cholinesterase at both nicotinic and muscarinic synapses. In this case, it activates muscarinic receptors M1 to 5. Noradrenaline activates alpha and beta adrenergic receptors. Preganglionic sympathetic fibers also stimulate the adrenal medulla to, re to release systemic adrenaline, which is an adrenergic agonist with more affinity for beta receptors, but serves a primarily metabolic regulatory function in the physiological setting. All of these trimeric a trimeric G-protein coupled receptors which work via one of three second messenger pathways that I have color coded to the receptors. First, we have the stimulatory pathway which stimulates adenylyl cyclase to convert ATP to CAMP and activate protein kinase A. This pathway is the mode of sympathetic stimulation of the heart primarily via beta-1 adrenergic receptors. The pathway increases sodium conductance, causing membrane depolarization, as well as calcium conductance, which also contributes to depolarization, as well as enhancing inotropy. The pathway, along with the cyclic GMP pathway, inhibits smooth muscle contraction, as I covered in depth in the pulmonary vasodilator video. In the heart, it also increases circa-driven calcium flux back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum by inhibiting phospholamban and enhances leucotropy or relaxation between action potentials. The inhibitory IO 
pathway inhibits adenylocyclase, causing the opposite of these effects, as well as specifically enhancing potassium conductance via the GERC channel to hyperpolarize the membrane. This is the mechanism of vagal cardiac inhibition via muscarinic M2 receptors. It's also the mode of action of adenosine on heart rate via A1 adenosine receptors that are not shown here. The Q11 pathway decreases potassium conductance and activates protein kinase C and calcium mediated second messengers. The most notable effect of Q11 stimulation is smooth muscle contraction, for example, vasoconstriction. This pathway is the primary mechanism for sympathetically mediated increase in vascular resistance and stress blood volume via alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. The effect of muscarinic signaling on vascular smooth muscle is relatively minor by comparison, but does help to regulate regional blood flow. In most cases, M3 is the muscarinic receptor involved, which causes vasoconstriction via Q11 if present on vascular smooth muscle cells. Interestingly, the same M3 receptors often produce vasodilation instead via an indirect mechanism. Stimulation of the endothelial Q11 pathway leads to release of nitric oxide and prostacyclin, which stimulate relaxation of nearby vascular smooth muscle via the CGMP and CAMP pathways respectively. For more information, again, check out the pulmonary vasodilators video. The same effects mediates cerebral vasodilation via M5 receptors. Now we've covered the individual reflexes and pathways, I'm going to try to demonstrate how these responses are integrated in the common physiological stress of changes in blood volume. The 0% represents euvolemia for the vertical midline and baseline hemodynamics along the horizontal midline. The plots themselves are the best they could estimate based on a range of human and animal studies. Starting with heart rate, you'll see a similar graph in many textbooks that focuses on the V-shaped relationship in the center. Heart rate initially tends to increase with a change in blood volume in either direction, with a local minimum when the subject is euvolemic. Systemic blood pressure tends to decline with hypovolemia, but stay relatively stable with increased volume. You'll see a similar relationship with stroke volume, while cardiac output tends to be relatively proportional, roughly proportional to effective blood volume. The slightly counterintuitive increase in heart rate with volume is due to the Bainbridge reflex. As mentioned, this is relatively transient and most pronounced with rapid increase in blood volume. Many studies of healthy adult humans given moderate to large fluid infusions found heart rate close to baseline an hour or so later. The baroreceptor reflex is much stronger by comparison and leads to systemic vasodilation, which maintains blood pressure close to baseline. The increase in stroke volume with filling is due to the intrinsic frank starling mechanism, and cardiac output is simply the product of heart rate and stroke volume. Things get more interesting on the hypovolemia side, probably because hypo hypervolemia is not usually a major threat to survival, and tends to be regulated through decreased intake and renal elimination of fluid. The initial and most rapid negative feedback mechanisms for a decline in blood volume are the arterial baroreflexes, which increase heart rate and SVR to preserve systemic arterial pressure. This can be due to an absolute or relative reduction in blood volume, for example, um, due to venous pooling or other impairments to venous return. One of the best experimental models for hypovolemia in humans is the application of lower body negative pressure with a device resembling an iron lung. As discussed in the section on the Barcroft at home reflex, at some point the tachycardia dissipates or at least becomes less pronounced, subject to individual patient and situation factors. It's possible that the bezel jarish reflex might also contribute if the LV is severely underfilled, but I don't think that's the major mechanism. The so-called reverse Bainbridge reflex is also suggested to play a role, but I'm especially skeptical of that one, as I mentioned before. As the body enters a state of clinical shock, chemoreceptors, 
sense decreased oxygen delivery as well as acidemia and ischemic products and further augment the blood pressure. This is particularly important once pressure falls below the minimum needed to trigger high pressure baroreceptors. These, along with cardiorespiratory coupling, will augment the tachycardia response and attempt to optimize oxygen delivery to essential regions and correct acidemia. When all else fails, the cerebral perfusion is compromised and cerebral perfusion is compromised, the CNS ischemic response will trigger a surge of sympathetic activity in an attempt to maintain pressure. So far, this has all been under the assumption that the neural pathways are intact. Some of the mechanisms are most apparent when the afferent or efferent pathways are interrupted. For example, spinal anesthesia causes a reduction in vascular resistance and stress blood volume by inhibiting efferent outflow from part of the sympathetic chain. For abdominal surgery, the effective block is aimed around T4, which is below the level of most fibers supplying the heart, so stimulation of rate and contractility are generally preserved, though the loss of preload can trigger a vaguely mediated bradycardia in some cases. In an unintentionally high spinal block, preganglionic sympathetic outflow can be essentially eliminated causing a more significant disturbance in hemodynamics. When the spinal cord is disrupted at the cervical levels, the preganglionic sympathetic neurons are generally still intact, but lose stimulation from the bulbospinal fibers. A degree of hypotension appears to be universal following isolated complete cervical spine injury with 30 to 50% requiring vasopressor support. Heart rate will be inappropriately low due to sympathetic denervation of the heart and interruption of the entire sympathetic um, efferent pathway preventing baroreflex correction. This state, known in its severe form as neurogenic shock, often persists for around five weeks and many patients will have a chronically low normal blood pressure and symptoms of orthostatic hypotension. Cardiovascular reflexes exist at many levels and there are still important reflex arcs in the spinal cord distal to the transection. Over time, there can be remodeling of these neurons as well as changes in vascular sensitivity that enhance the gain of existing reflexes between visceral and somatic afferents and spinal sympathetic afferents. This combined with the lack of effective baroreflex regulation can manifest as so-called autonomic dysreflexia. A variety of painful or even innocuous sensations from the skin, abdomen or pelvic organs, for example bladder distension, trigger an uncontrolled increase in sympathetic vascular tone and life-threatening hypertension. Management involves repositioning the patient to utilize orthostatic hypotension, identifying and removing the inciting stimulus and blood pressure monitoring and control typically with a titratable vasodilator. Another relatively extreme situation is a patient who undergoes a heart transplant. In this case, all afferent fibers, parasympathetic and sympathetic afferents to the heart are severed. Much of the intrinsic cardiac nervous system of the donor heart with its associated ganglia and simple reflexes, reflex arcs might be preserved but they completely lose their connection to the vagus and sympathetic nerves. What you have now is an effectively denervated heart, but an intact aortic, carotid and central sensors, as well as sympathetic innervation to most of the vascular system. Surprisingly, the heart will still function pretty well. Without parasympathetic innervation, the rate will sit around 100 beats per minute and lack respiratory variation. Looking back at our original graph, cardiac output curve is now relatively fixed, and cardiac output is determined primarily by changes in the venous return curve. Like before, with increased demand, local tissue factors decrease resistance and increase venous return, increasing cardiac output. The stress blood volume can be augmented by sympathetic stimulation, allowing even greater capacity with increased demand. Sympathetic withdrawal or loss of intravascular volume will have the opposite effect. These hearts are sometimes described as preload dependent. Overall, the heart can function adequately because, but lacks the many layers of fine tuning by neuro, neural control and reflexes. For example, when compensating for rapid changes in posture or activity,
Over time, the heart may become more sensitive to circulating catecholamines released from the adrenal medulla and remote sympathetic nerves. This might allow some neural control over heart rate and contractility, but with a noticeable time lag. Recipients will notice a sub-maximal -max exercise tolerance compared to well controls, though this is still a great improvement from end-stage cardiac failure. A particularly interesting element of cardiac transplantation is the effect of certain drugs on the denervated heart. Atropine doesn't work because the heart lacks muscarinic synapses. Anticholinesterase agents like neostigmine generally don't cause bradycardia for the same reason. Beta blockers do actually have significant effects on the heart, possibly due to circulating catecholamines or because many beta blockers are inverse agonists. They do uh, further reduce cardiac output and exercise tolerance, and many patients actually have trouble tolerating them, especially in the first six months post transplant. As mentioned, the heart can be more sensitive to beta agonists, primarily because they are no longer cleared by presynaptic nerve terminals. Adenosine, which is used um, when it's used for termination of SVT, is actually far more effective in patients with a heart transplant, both in terms of potency of, of effect and duration of action. The former may be mediated at the receptor or second messenger level, possibly related to the loss of muscarinic receptors using the same pathway. The latter is because the bradycardia caused by adenosine is usually partially interrupted by baroreflex mediated adrenergic stimulation. The transplanted heart lacks sympathetic efferents to the heart to complete that reflex. As a result, you need to use smaller doses of adenosine. Finally, Digoxin works relatively directly as a positive inotrope, but its negative effect on AV conduction is vaguely mediated. It's thought that digoxin enhances cholinergic transmission at multiple levels and specifically sensitizes the arterial baroreflex. As a result, in a denovated heart, digoxin is, at, is effective as an inotrope, but not as an antiarrhythmic. Reinnovation of the transplanted heart does occur but it's highly variable and it can take years, in which case some of these effects will start to normalize. Now for some quick book reviews. I don't have any sponsorships or conflicts of interest. I just wanted to share which ones were particularly useful. This was the single most useful book I could find on the topic of cardiac reflexes. It's fantastic. It was the only source that had any idea how the Bainbridge reflex actually worked, for example. I bought the paperback for 100 euros, which was almost one euro per page. Um, you can find electronic versions for much cheaper online. Um, there are a couple of other books on the topic that I referenced in passing. Uh, the Crosstalk one has a sister book on um, respiratory physiology, which is also amazing and I used for the neural control of respiration. I also used Nunn and West's textbooks um, at times. This was the most, the second most useful book for the entire presentation. Um, it's as comprehensive an approach to autonomic physiology as you will ever need and relatively accessible. The diagrams help me figure out which, what, what the respiratory and cardiovascular columns actually were in the medulla. Um, there was another one here that wasn't bad either. This is my favorite textbook on cardiac physiology. It's very clear and accessible and had good reflex content. Um, this small Italian book on the left was surprisingly content rich and helped me get started. The one on the right I had from the pulmonary vasodilators video and still great. Uh, these are my two general physiology reflexes, uh, uh, references. Um, and the, the human nervous system was very comprehensive and I used quite a bit. Computational Neuroscience gave me the network diagram that I included in the video. Um, I use these Springer books for more clinical topics such as transplant physiology. The vasovagal syncope book was also particularly useful um, and I use these for specific topics as well. Um, this brainstem atlas and related texts were very useful. It's quite hard to navigate such a dense and poorly defined region. Um, and I used a lot of anatomy books as art inspiration. Um, I used well over 100 journal articles, um, which don't display as well on screen. Um, 
and I'll include most of them in the description, but special reference to this one as it not only gave me the idea to use 3D graphics for the brainstem nuclei, but also gave me the choice of software and the actual images. Um, I exported 291 images from the supplemental data as a PDF, and I used 3D Slicer, which is an open source resource available at slicer.org to manually resegment the nuclei that I needed and then export the reconstructed images. The rotating transition animations, I used a batch import export tool in Slicer, and then I converted that into a video in Photoshop. I would like to specifically thank YouTuber, the virtual paleontologist, who taught me how to use 3D Slicer with her channel. Um, I also came across this anesthetic channel, Forever Learning, which has a ton of similar content that might interest you. And as always, check out Deranged Physiology, which is my starting reference for all of these topics. Thanks for watching. I hope you found it informative. Um, this is certainly my most intense video in, so far in terms of production, probably because it was so anatomy heavy. I've also been trying to stretch my PowerPoint abilities for animations such as this one. I am planning to sit the CICM primary exam in a few months, so this will be my last big video until then. I'll try to focus on much shorter, more focused topics until then. If you like this video, please subscribe for more content. Check out my other videos and share this channel with others. Bye for now.